Several weeks later, the climate at Kent was noticeably cooler. Police returned to the Kent State campus this morning after over two weeks for no rallies, meetings, protests, or voting in progress to disrupt normal academic routine. The climax to recent campus conflict came last night with the results of a referendum sponsored by the concerned citizens of the KSU community. Voting by both students and faculty supported administrative stands against SDS, immediate student suspensions, and hearings procedures against violent protesters. The proposal for a four-day boycott of classes also was soundly defeated by the nearly 9,000 ballots cast yesterday. Early this morning, President Robin I. White urged the campus to take a cooling-off period for the remainder of the spring quarter. The normal business of the university should proceed for all students, fac staff, and faculty, said Dr. White. He also requested that all pending questions be directed towards his newly appointed Student Faculty Study Commission and said steps are being taken through Dr. Robert E. Matson, the Vice President for Student Affairs, to update the Student Conduct Code in line with mandatory state laws. This is Jim Carfield reporting from Kent State University. From the time of the April disturbances until almost exactly one year later, KSU seemed to be, once again, just another university. Then, on the evening of April 30, 1970, television viewers across the nation saw regular programming preempted by a special statement from the President of the United States, Richard Nixon. Tonight, American and South Vietnamese units will attack the headquarters for the entire communist military operation in South Vietnam. This key control center has been occupied by the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong for five years in blatant violation of Cambodia's neutrality. To many students, the widening of U.S. military forces into Cambodia both scared and angered them. It meant living under the fear of a continued draft in a country which had refused to acknowledge past voices of protest. It meant the continuation of an undeclared war they had grown up with almost all their lives. It meant more nightly news clips of dying soldiers and homeless mothers and children. The following day on May 1st, a noon rally was held on the commons. The ringing of the victory bell brought an assembly of three to four hundred students together, led by Steve Sheroff, Chris Plant, and Robert Franklin. Left-wing rhetoric filled the air as a copy of the Constitution was buried in the ground. Shortly after, the rally dispersed with no disturbances. That same afternoon, the black United students held a rally which also ended peaceably. Feeling university conditions were stable, President White caught a 5.30 p.m. flight out to Mason City, Iowa, where other business awaited him. He would not return to Kent until Sunday, May 3rd. Friday night was a warm night. The bars on North Water Street were serving liquor, but just as intoxicating were the spirits of politics and spring. At 10.42 p.m., a beer bottle was thrown at a passing police car. Hey, patrol car, passing by, halted to a stop. Said officer, my dog in dismay. The boss can't do a decent job. The kids got no respect for the law today. Two successive patrol cars were also pelted with objects. Bargoers began to congregate on the sidewalk and street. Members of a motorcycle gang, the chosen few, performed various stunts to the applause and approval of the crowd. A bonfire was lit in the middle of North Water Street at 11.30 p.m. Twenty minutes later, part of the crowd began moving towards the center of town, smashing windows along the way. An internal communique entitled, For Your Information, later reported that 50 plate glass windows were shattered as the group turned up Main Street toward campus. The group diminished in numbers until it reached the edge of campus at Main and Lincoln Streets where police unleashed a barrage of tear gas, scattering the mob. So many more people were involved Friday night and became involved when they closed the bars and sent everyone into the streets so that you had, instead of maybe 200 people being gassed, you had a couple thousand being gassed. Okay, so all these people got involved. Guys out with their dates, they were gassed. Uh, guys who were in the bars watching the, the Lakers-Knicks game on television, these people were suddenly, you know, zap lights come on, okay, leave, we're closing the bar. In the fourth quarter of the Lakers-Knicks game, a lot of people will get upset at this. And they get outside, suddenly they're confronted by policemen with clubs, helmets, gas, not even knowing what's going on. This is, this is a very traumatic thing. 
I mean, to, to suddenly walk out of a place where you've been comfortably seated and to be tear gassed, to be confronted with uh, nightsticks, with, with hundreds of policemen, and be pushed back to a place possibly where you don't even live. Like everyone was pushed back to the campus. Well, a lot of students didn't live on the campus when we're being pushed in the opposite direction from which they lived. A curfew was declared by Mayor Satrum and 14 people were arrested. By 3 a.m. Saturday morning, all was once again quiet in Kent. The National Guard had been placed on alert. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Early Saturday morning, a reporter surveyed the downtown damage. The four big main picture windows at the first federal building here have been broken. And the glass you hear now is the sound of it being knocked out for repair. One big hole at Ohio Edison that's pat patched up with cardboard and masking tape will have to be replaced, however. Service trucks downtown on North Water now, helping with cleanup procedures. There's various 55-gallon uh, barrels here just filled with glass. Hardest building hit by count was the Portage National Bank, including the credit department. All the windows on the east side of North Water Street, just about the great majority of them, were damaged. Acting in the city's best interests, Mayor Satrum declared, An emergency exists, and a curfew will be in effect at 8 p.m. on Saturday, May 2nd. 1970. We ask for the cooperation of all Kent citizens during this period. By noon Saturday, Kent Police Chief Roy Thompson was receiving distressed phone calls from town merchants. It seems that anonymous telephoners were threatening the store owners to either place anti-war signs in their windows or run the risk of having their establishments burned. Throughout the day, Chief Thompson continued to remind the mayor of reports which allegedly identified weathermen on campus. The day was ugly with rumors of LSD in the water supply and plans to burn down the town. Meanwhile, word was spreading of an evening rally to be held on the commons. At 5 p.m., Mayor Satrum contacted Governor Rhodes and requested the aid of the Ohio National Guard. University officials were not advised of this action. Three hours later, the rally on the commons was in progress with about 700 people in attendance. At 8.30 p.m., someone threw flares into the ROTC building and set it ablaze. This minute, the building is erupting in huge flames and crackling. You can hear the ammunition. Ladies and gentlemen, I suggest if you're not involved, you leave the area. You are subject to arrest. The uh, building just fell in on one end, and the students on the hillside are now applauding. When fire trucks arrived nearly 20 minutes later, firemen were thwarted and harassed. We did receive this call at approximately... 8 o'clock last night about this ROTC building being on fire. We proceeded to the campus area for this fire. Immediately after starting to lay in on this fire, we were surrounded, harassed, interfered with by the riders. They did damage our hose. They cut it, and we had to pull out. We were getting stoned. What was can, bricks, you name it. We did pull out, and within a very short period after that, after being assured of protection, we did move back in on the scene. The internal communique, for your information, reported it this way. At the request of Mayor Satrum, the National Guard, which had earlier been placed on alert by Governor James Rhodes, was called. The Ohio Highway Patrol was also called for assistance. The crowd on the commons began to retreat from the gas attack as it moved toward Taylor Hall. Small grass fires were set, and a blaze was ignited in a trash barrel. Demonstrators, upon reaching a physical education supply shed next to the tennis courts, began to break its windows. It was set afire and burned to the ground. There's tear gas going off in the background. The students have dispersed from the tennis courts. At 9.40 p.m., 
the National Guard appeared on Main Street. The crowd decided to take another look at the ROTC building to see if it was still on fire. As it moved toward the blazing ROTC building, University police moved forward, firing tear gas. National Guard members scattered the remnants of the demonstrators beyond the commons. Generals Canterbury and Del Corso of the National Guard are now on the campus directing the entire action. By 9.45 p.m., the ROTC building had nearly been leveled. Crews are now just hosing down what is left of the building. It's about a stack of five feet of rubble. A few flames on each end right now. The Guard maintained security all night. The campus of Kent State University is relatively quiet now as students have settled in their dorms and homes for the night. Approximately 600 National Guardsmen from Akron and the Cleveland areas are deployed either on campus or in the community nearby. The units are under the direction of Major General Sylvester Del Corso, commander of the Ohio National Guard. Lieutenant Colonel John Spain, in explaining the presence of the Guard in Kent, said, quote, We are here to assist the civil authorities and the city and the campus security office in restoring order. The Guard was called in response to student disturbances that resulted in the burning of a $50,000 ROTC building last night. The ROTC building was not just any other building. It was the ROTC building, which represented a symbol which was uh, judged negative. Mid-morning on Sunday, Governor Rhodes arrived in Kent. A press conference was scheduled for 10 a.m. in the firehouse. We're seen here at uh, the city of Kent, especially. Probably the most vicious form of campus-oriented violence yet perpetrated by dissident groups and their allies in the state of Ohio. For this reason, most of the dissident groups have operated within the campus. This has moved over where they have threatened and intimidated merchants and people of this community. Now it ceases to be a problem of, of the colleges in Ohio. This now is the problem of the state of Ohio. And I want to assure you that we're going to employ every force of law that we have under our authority, not only to get to the bottom of the situation here at Kent, on the campus, in the city, and we have asked the complete cooperation of the district attorney of the federal government because federal supplies were burned and destroyed in the ROTC building. And these people, after we can find them, after a complete investigation, will be turned over to the federal government, we've asked the county prosecutor for a complete and comprehensive investigation. And there's some people now out on probation that there has been a strong word to the fact that they have participated in this. Now, we're going to put a stop to this for this reason. The same group that we're dealing with here today, and there's three or four of them, they only have one thing in mind, that is to destroy higher education in Ohio. And if they continue this and continue what they're doing, they're going to reach their goal for the simple reason that you cannot continue to set fires to buildings that are worth five and ten million dollars because you cannot get replacement from the High General Assembly. And last night, I think that we have seen all forms of violence, the worst. And when they start taking over communities, this is when we're going to use every part of the law enforcement agency of Ohio to drive them out of Kent. We're going to make two recommendations to the High General Assembly. Now, we've had this at Miami, in Oxford, Ohio, also at Ohio State University, and we had 32 police officers injured, and a couple very severe. We have the same groups going from one campus to the other, and they use a university, state-supported by the taxpayer of Ohio as a sanctuary. And in this, they make definite plans of burning, destroying, and throwing rocks at police and at the National Guard and the Highway Patrol. We're asking the legislature that any person throwing a rock, brick, or stone at a law enforcement agency or high a sheriff, policeman, Highway Patrol, National Guard becomes a felony. And secondly, we're going to ask for legislation that any person in the administrative side, or as a student, if these people are convicted, whether it's a misdemeanor or felony, participating in a riot, they're automatically dismissed, there's no hearing, no recourse, and they cannot enter another state university in the state of Ohio. We are going to eradicate the problem.
We're not going to treat the symptoms. And as long as this continues, higher education in Ohio is in jeopardy. And if they continue to give permissive consent, they will destroy higher education in this state. At 1.25 p.m., NewsRap, a university news service via telephone, reported that Ohio Governor James A. Rhodes has declared a state of emergency to exist on the Kent State University campus and has ordered members of the National Guard to halt all rallies or demonstrations, peaceful or otherwise. Guard officers have ordered a 1 a.m. Monday curfew on campus for all students and unauthorized personnel. Any unauthorized persons moving about the campus after 1 a.m. Monday will be subject to arrest. The city ordinance restricting pedestrian movement after 8 p.m. throughout the city remains in effect. The afternoon of May 3rd was, all in all, considerably quiet. Many have termed it to have been a carnival atmosphere. After two nights of tension and violence, the campus appeared to be a quiet forest of question marks. Students eyed guardsmen and guardsmen watched students. Late Sunday afternoon, President White, who had returned several hours earlier, issued a statement. The university's position on several matters should be made quite clear at this time. First, Kent State University has been disastrously hurt. The hopes of all on campus have been placed in jeopardy, and whether or not any part of that loss can be retrieved depends upon immediate responsible actions from all quarters of the university community. We must show to the nation that Kent State University has much more to it than the ugliness it has seen in our midst. Second, we ought to be and are grateful for the effort and response from so many members of student and faculty leadership in the various security operations. These efforts help temper the situation. Third, by order of the governor, the National Guard will remain in the Kent community and campus until its leadership decides their departure is safe. Events have taken those decisions out of university hands. Widespread damage and threats in the community have created an alarming situation. Fourth and finally, the university plans to maintain normal operations and classes will meet as scheduled. Between 7 and 8 p.m. that evening, students began to congregate on the commons. This was in violation of a state of emergency order which barred outdoor rallies and demonstrations. The students are now marching around the hub and onto the commons. The time is 8.20. The group headed towards President White's house. Now, 25 minutes before 9, the group has started to move toward the northeast part of the campus. They circled the Eastway complex. They're now heading toward the Tri Towers. Time is now 10 minutes before 9 o'clock. Hey, look. Two fires have now broken out in front of the music and speech building near the parking lot area. All right. Attention, all Kent State students go inside the dorm. Do not remain on the outside. As they approached the structure, students were met by tear gas. We got, we got gas again. Oh, my goodness, that stuff's horrible. <laughs> we were standing in the wind, and this thing directed me, or came directly across on us. Oh, my eyes. National Guardsmen forced back the crowd of approximately 3,000, and in the retreat, a splinter group of 200 turned and moved toward Main Street. One group was heading downtown on Main Street. 
They are now reported that a group is holed up in the library. They broke in. They are in the library. An ambulance has been dispatched to that place. The building has been surrounded. They called for a bullhorn down there to talk to these students. Others continue in the Main Street area. At the intersection of Lincoln and Main, a confrontation developed. For your information, later reported that... Demonstrators made an effort to bargain with the guardsmen. They apparently thought that if they would move out of the street onto university property, both President White and Mayor Safram would come and speak with them. Above the street scene, helicopters surveyed the area for so-called snipers. Right above me is the helicopter with a massive searchlight. The time is now 10 o'clock. About an hour later, 11 p.m., the guard initiated disbursement using tear gas, billy clubs, and bayonets. In the melee, demonstrators pelted guardsmen with rocks. There were injuries on both sides. At this point, many students felt they had been betrayed. As one student said the next day, Did you know about the betrayal last night on front campus? They told us we were going to be granted amnesty if we came back on the campus. We came back on the campus, the guards came on us, started throwing gas, and chased us from one end of the campus down there to Tri Towers. And they lied to us. They said President White and the mayor of Kent were going to speak to us. President was, White didn't know anything about it. They're they trying said, to get rid of him now. They said they were going to speak to us. And we so we came back on campus. And what do they do? They start ban. We know a lot of kids that were bayoneted, too, in the back and side and stomach. In all, 68 arrests were reported. Within 40 minutes, General Canterbury considered the campus secure and quiet. Orders to break any outdoor assembly, whether peaceful or not, have been given as a result of Governor Rhodes' declaration of a state of emergency. Tear gas was used tonight to disperse a crowd of approximately 500 assembling in violation of these orders. The curfew that has just been imposed means that all students must immediately return to their dorms and remain there until tomorrow morning. All unauthorized persons moving on the campus will be subject to arrest by the National Guard. A curfew is also in effect in the city of Kent until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. By Monday morning, May 4th, the Guard were tired and irritable. Most men of Charlie Company, Alpha Company, and G Troop had been on 12-hour shifts since arriving Saturday night. Before coming to Kent, the guardsmen had been on duty at a trucker's strike in Akron. Many had not had a proper meal in days. There was still fear of the possibility of snipers. The commons, being the focal point of activity for the past three days, once again set the stage for the final act in a dreadful play. Students began congregating during mid-morning, and, as scheduled classes let out, the flux of movement across campus was guided more and more towards the commons. Some went deliberately to the rally, while others were simply en route to other classes or lectures. The victory bell rang out its call only to be answered by a scratchy and metallic bullhorn. At 11.59, General Canterbury issued the order to move out and disperse the crowd. Estimates of the crowd range anywhere from 800 to 1,100. Fact verifies there were 113 National Guardsmen on the scene. Initial disbursement began with the firing of tear gas, but as canisters reached the student ranks, Demonstrators lobbed the gas back towards the guard. Then Major Harry Jones moved forward with his segment of troops 
and forced the students up and over the crest of Taylor Hill, adjacent to the commons. The troops divided, and Charlie Company manned a left flank, while G Troop and A Company proceeded to the right of Taylor Hall. Instead of stopping there, the right flank continued down the other side of the hill into a football practice field. This move literally pinned the men in between a wire fence and oncoming students. Rock throwing, mostly by students, littered this entire sequence of events. I think by the time Monday came around, I think why many of these students maybe had even resorted to throwing rocks when they never would have done it before was that we wanted those National Guard out of our community. It was our home, our community of 20,000, and there was no communication. At 12.22, the Guard began retreating back towards the Pagoda, a structure at the top of Taylor Hill. Students took this as a sign of victory. At 12.24, the guard reached the pagoda, suddenly stopped, turned 135 degrees, and... When it was over, 13 bodies lay on the ground. Jeffrey Miller was dead. A bullet which had entered through his mouth had left him with the top of his head partially blown off, and still bleeding. Bill Schroeder lay in agony until he died ten minutes later in the hospital. Allison Krauss was DOA. Sandy Shore also was dead on arrival. Nine other students were wounded. In shock, students and faculty members tried in somewhat of a daze to administer aid to the injured. It was a nightmare. One of the dramatic photos is where you see Joseph Lewis lying on the ground and the guard is just turning at that point and they're going to march back to the point they came from. And now they're leaving behind kids who are dying, one dead and others wounded. And I think it was 15 to 20 minutes before they let the ambulances go up. In other words, medics do not go out and treat enemy wounded. You mean they have been shot? They have been shot. They are dead. How long ago did this happen? 15 minutes. What do you think they're on murder for? Yeah, it happened to they are shot. But the guard, moved, the guard moved back to the corner of Taylor Hall and followed, and they are still stoning them. But then all of a sudden, they got right by the corner and uh, just, just turned around and started firing. They, uh... Oh, yeah, close the university so we can up. forget about our dead brothers. When the crowd began to grasp the situation, shock quickly turned to unrepressed anger. Psychology professor Seymour Barron and geology professor Glenn Frank both played decisive roles in calming students. Well, let me tell you, I spoke to the general down there, and believe me, we've got a, we've got a real live general. He doesn't wear a soldier suit, but he's a general anyway. And I told him, I said, listen, you guys have caused enough trouble here today. Now, for God's sakes, will you at least put your guns away? Well, soldiers never like to put guns down. That's against their rules and regulations. So I said, well, what do you do, you know, when you keep your guns away so that people know you're not going to shoot them? They've got them now at what I think they call some kind of parade rest or other, which means that they've got the butts of the guns on the ground. Now, let me tell you this. I said to him, you have already committed a couple of crimes here today. You've already... Some very serious problems. You killed at least one student that I know of, 
and I was right with and helped into the ambulance another one that got a, a 30 caliber round through his shoulder. Now they've got live ammo. I wouldn't have believed that. They've got live ammo in those guns. Now if you walk down towards them, I promise you, they'll kill you. Please, don't, don't let anybody start you again in going across this campus. We've had bloodshed. It's a terrible thing that's happened here today. This campus will never forget it. But don't, don't, don't start chasing across this field again. Let's sit for a moment in silence. Then, for heaven's sake, let's get up and slowly and in a reasonable way march off of here away from those men with the guns. No. 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 I don't want your kids to die. You're too many of you are too damn good to die in a stinking field here. Please. Hold on. Please. Please listen to me right now. I don't care whether you've never listened to anyone before in your lives. I am begging you right now. If you don't disperse right now, they're going to move in, and it can only be a slaughter. Would you please listen to me? I don't want to be a part of this. Please. I'm begging you also. Follow me out this way. Telling me I got to beware. I think it's time we stop. stop. Children, what's that sound? Everybody, look what's going down. There's battle lines being drawn, and nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Young people speak in their minds Are getting so much resistance From behind Give time where to stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going now Stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going now Better stop now What's that sound? Everybody look what's going now Unless you were there, the listener cannot even begin to appreciate the situation in Kent Monday afternoon. The rumors and threats of reprisals between students in the community were unbelievable. Ron Kane, county prosecutor, obtained an injunction to close down the university. The campus was to be evacuated immediately. Some students were arrested indiscriminately and refused their legal rights. President White wasn't even allowed in his office. He issued this statement. Everyone, without exception, is horror struck at the tragedy of the last few hours. Unfortunately, no one is yet able to say with certainty what the facts of the situation are. There are many unconfirmed reports of gunfire from various sources. We are asking for every possible appropriate investigation which we shall undertake to pursue to the limit. We have closed the university for the remainder of the week to permit investigation and to provide for the full restitution of the university's program. We need the cooperation of all, especially including the presentation of factual information by anyone who possesses it. Kent, Ohio was a hotbed of sparks ready to ignite. 
Tuesday, there were press conferences held by General Canterbury and President White. General, can you tell us whether or not you have yet learned whether anyone did give an order to fire? And so who? And weren't you there? I was there. There was no order to fire. What about a sniper, sir? We have still not confirmed a sniper. How far General Del Corso in Columbus has ruled out the possibility of a sniper? You, please uh, phrase that one again. I say General Del Corso in an interview in Columbus has ruled out the possibility of a sniper. I think that General Del Corso's position is the same as mine. We know that there's every possibility that the troops were shot at. We have been, un been unable to confirm. What evidence do you have? I'd rather not go into that at this point. He's being investigated. General, the guard, the guard is authorized to fire if their lives are in danger. Is rock throwing considered such a danger? Uh, considering the size of the rocks and the proximity of those people throwing them, I would su suggest in this case that their lives was in danger. Were they ordered to fire in the air before shooting to kill? They were not ordered to fire at all. Who was in charge there, General? I think that basically uh, I was in charge. You were in charge of the troops? You were you direct I'm, I'm not a direct troop commander, gentlemen. However, I was there. Sir, Commander, sir, do you think that the response of the guard to what happened, what the students were doing, was justified? Do I feel that the, the shooting was justified? And, and the consequences of it, sir. Uh, obviously, when four people lose their lives and nine are injured, the consequences are never justified. And I don't think you can broach it in those terms. I do think you have to approach it in the terms of the lives of the guardsmen that was being jeopardized. This is the only justification. Well, can you tell us who issued the ceasefire order and how he determined the lives of the guardsmen no longer were in danger? When the shooting took place, the rioters started to, to disperse. And the, all the officers on the line immediately uh, implemented a ceasefire. We will begin with a statement from President White, after which we'll be pleased to entertain your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you appreciate the fact that matters have been both horrible, time-consuming, on occasion, uh, without the ability to know just what was going on, so to whatever extent I'm unable to answer your questions, I hope for your forgiveness. Mrs. White and I sent this telegram to the parents of the four who were dead. The thoughts of Mrs. White and I are with you in your terrible loss. As parents ourselves, we are filled with horror and with shock. We pray for support to you in this hour, knowing full well, of course, that words are inadequate. Around the world, Kent State University was the headline. Meanwhile, back in America, an embittered father, Arthur Krauss, spoke on national television. She was deeply interested in helping people. She truly cared about people and life. On Saturday evening, she called home to tell me there was some trouble in the business section of Kent. She said there was some property damage, and she was against that. She was not involved in that, but she felt they had to demonstrate she felt they had to do this because there was no other way to express themselves. She resented being called a bum because she disagreed with someone else's opinion. She felt that war in Cambodia was wrong. Is this dissent a crime? Is this a reason for killing her? Have we come to such a state in this country? that a young girl has to be shot because she disagrees deeply with the actions of her government. 
I want something to be done. What I would like to see happen is that my daughter's death and those of the other three children, as well as the wounded, not be in vain. I would like to see Congress investigate the situation and determine who authorized live ammunition to be brought against children by a tired and frightened National Guard. Also, who approved such an action? Can Congress find out why our children can't express themselves? There it was on television. That makes it true, doesn't it? I mean, if they say it on television, it has to be right. My God, I kept saying, it's on television, but it can't be right. Nobody would shoot on a campus. They're wooden soldiers with ten guns. Those aren't bullets. Kids in the National Guard are just kids who aren't in Vietnam. They're not different. They're not shooter-uppers. But then kids on campuses aren't Berna Downers either. Yet there was burning down. And if burning down happened, I guess shooting up can happen too. Maybe if I close my eyes, I, I will think I heard wrong. I close my eyes. Four children still are dead. Four mothers now must learn that to teach a child to say please and thank you is no longer enough. Children now must learn bullets kill. And when the National Guard shoots, you have to duck. Four fathers are not fathers anymore. When will the sound of bullets reach the ears of men who cannot hear? Four children still are dead. In this, a world of mourning, I weep for the children who died and for the children who killed them. This nation was born out of disorder and founded on freedom and the will of the people. People need guidance, Harry. Give them what they want today and what will they ask for next, tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe a 40-hour week. Maybe the vote for women. What difference does it make? Will you let go? Let go! Stop trying to hold back the hands of the clock! It'll tear your arms out! Don't you feel what you mean when you say it is coming true? Can't you see the writing on the wall? Don't you feel the floor and ceiling closing in on you? Oh, don't you feel it all? The producer wishes to thank the Office of Radio TV Information, the University News Service, and the archives of Kent State University. Death of a Decade, the Kent State Story, was written, engineered, and produced by Corey Dietz. All sounds in this program were authentic, except for the news wrap segment, which was a recreation from the original transcript. Portions of this program were produced at the studios of WKSU-FM in Kent, Ohio. Your narrator has been John Burke.